Welcome back. I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to present a recorded webinar from my Patreon members from one year ago. It's titled Hydronic Systems Survey. We're going to discuss boilers, vent systems, combustion air, boiler feeds, expansion tanks, air elimination, system piping, terminals, and controls. That's a lot. Without further ado, here's the training. So let's start first with why the boiler failed in the first place. Typically, a lot of cast iron boilers fail when they run dry and they crack because they overheated. I think that's probably the number one reason you see actually any boiler fail. More and more high efficient boilers tend to actually fail due to holes in the heat exchanger though. This is typically caused from corrosion starting on the inside and the water quality. You could get corrosion on the outside of that heat exchanger as well if you have improper fuel mixture. And then of course, don't forget to check the flue. I see a lot of boilers fail because chimneys and flues get plugged. Now, when we look at the vent system, I guess we should start with masonry chimneys. Most new boilers need liners. And when you do that liner, you need to make sure there's still the ability to clean that liner out. You need to take a quick look at the vent connector to make sure it's in great condition if you're gonna reuse it. Most of the time, this gets replaced with a new system. All chimneys need to meet the National Fuel Gas Code, the NFGC code. When there's exterior chimneys that are made out of metal, you need to make sure there's no blockages and it's in good shape and secured correctly to the building. Obviously, all those joints still need to be gas tight and it shouldn't be running through heated areas. Of course, still needs to meet code. When we talk about combustion air, the NFGC code actually establishes how much air you need based on the BTU of the boiler you're installing. If you don't have enough space, then you're not gonna need to install some mechanical ventilation or what we affectionately call in the trade, a fan in a can. What a lot of people miss is when the boiler was put in, it most likely was accounting for all of the leakage, let's say in the unfinished basement. But what happens when you finish that basement off after the fact, now you may not have the combustion air you need for that existing boiler. So was the home tightened? That's a big deal. And if you don't check this, when you're gonna do a boiler replacement, you can't just assume that the amount of air that was there for the old one is still correct, even if you're replacing like for like. A lot of people just find ways for a direct vent system to go in at that point. Also, don't forget, a lot of people replace their kitchens or update their kitchens as well, and they may have installed a much larger vent hood. If you do this, it might depressurize the space and remove the combustion air that you would normally need for that boiler in the basement. So don't forget, is makeup air required for the new burners? All right, let's get to everyone's favorite, what looks like near boiler piping and all of the accessories there. If the system's still running and you're talking about looking at the boiler and the circulator and the fill line, first I would check to see if you're getting any sort of noise from the existing pump. If you're not using an ECM pump, and I would say that this is the case for any system, I would highly recommend the upgrade. I've seen a lot of pumps be reused only to fail a year or two later on that new boiler. If the system's running, you should be able to measure water flow. This could be easily measured if you're doing some simple math and measuring temperature difference. Always be sure there's no deadhead pumping. Of course, circulator location can lead to uh, the boiler failure in the first place. You should be pumping away from the expansion tank. That's the point of no pressure change. And also the same spot where you should be attaching your fill. Water pressure reducing valve and of course a backflow. Don't forget, check the water quality and see if you need to do any softening for that system as well. And what if you need glycol? A very important check to do when you're doing your hydronic system survey before you provide that new system quote. When you're working with a steam boiler, it's really important to check that fill line and the water feed. If it's gravity or single pipe, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that condensate return is sufficient for the new boiler. So if you're working on a very large boiler or a commercial application, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that auto fill is correctly piped and properly sized for the system. And even if you're not, even if this is a smaller residential unit, like this one at my house, highly recommend you install a water feeder. If you have 30 gallons in one year going into that steam system, I'm willing to bet you have a lot of leaks and that system's running a lot. Of course, you can see this picture from my house has been over the last seven years or so, so um, very tiny leaks. Now, when you're working with a water boiler, you obviously have to take a look at the expansion tank. There are two types of expansion tanks. There's the diaphragm style 
and the compression tank. Since the most popular expansion tank for water boilers in the United States is the diaphragm style, that's what I'm gonna focus on here. If you're testing the existing tank, what I would highly recommend is removing it from the system to be sure that it's intact. And when you do that, it's easiest to measure the fill pressure. Of course, that expansion tank should be located on the supply side of the boiler at the same spot where your water fill is prior to your pumps. So you're pumping away from the expansion tank. Now there's many ways to manage air or eliminate air from a water boiler. The most popular one I've seen these days are elimination systems like Spiravent. That happened to be my personal favorite. Of course, you could use traps, especially when it's located far away from the air elimination spiral vent. In that instance, you'd make sure there's air vents located on those far away radiators. Because new high efficient boilers tend to need more gallons per minute, I typically removed all boiler piping from the ceiling of the basement down. This just allowed me to pipe and size all of that for the new boiler. I could easily locate all of my pumps and make sure they're on the right spot in the near boiler piping. This also provided an easy way to do primary and secondary piping when I cut all of the supplies and returns at the ceiling of the basement. Don't forget to plan for multiple risers if you have a lot of supply and returns and zoning or maybe even mixed systems based on the radiation in the home. Oh, and if you're working on steam, don't forget to account for offset supply headers. Really important. Now, verifying the system piping size and the terminals or the radiation in the home is also a critical step. You can't put in a boiler that's too small based on the radiation needs or too big based on the radiation in the home. So when you're looking at, let's say, steam radiators, you wanna make sure they're installed correctly, you measure the equivalent area, and make sure it's sloped if it's single pipe so the condensate can drain back. Obviously, check for leaks. That's probably the number one thing. If you convert steam to hot water, you need to make sure there's enough surface area there to give you the same amount of BTUs, enough to heat the room. So this means a room by room load calculation is needed along with measuring the EDR of that radiator. If you're working with panel rads, you need to verify that temperature. Just because you want to run it at, let's say 120, doesn't mean you're going to get the BTUs needed out of that panel rad. Take a look at all of those baseboards, make sure they're clean, you have enough equivalent feet, that it's sloped, and air traps are installed where needed. Now controls is another whole animal. I'm willing to bet a lot of people out there that are specifying boilers are probably controls experts. Unfortunately, the electricians that they tend to use are not necessarily up to speed. So it starts with the thermostats. That's what the homeowner sees and most likely the technology they're asking for. But you need to also take a look at zone relays, pump relays, and of course valves. All of these items are in a very simple checklist located on the back of ACA manual RHH, residential hydronic heating. I highly recommend if you're doing boilers and boiler replacements on a regular basis, go out and get a copy of this. It has many resources inside this hundreds of page document. And like all ACA manuals, it's peer tested and reviewed. So they learn the hard way, not you. Before so what did you think of the overview on hydronic system surveys? I'd love to hear your feedback below. It's not something that I've worked on personally in quite some time. Obviously it's a big part of the residential contracting business here in the Northeast. If you like this training and you'd like to see more like this one year in advance, head over to my Patreon page where you can unlock last year's worth of videos and two previous years worth of written blogs for as little as $8 a month. Never mind the higher tiers that provide residential system design training in recorded modules and access to Q&A with me. Thanks again for joining me this week at HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.